So my name is Stuart Duguid. Um, I am a founder of a talent agency, Evolve, um, which all my clients are tennis players. Um, I was at um, Lagardere and then IMG, so I worked at the big agencies for a number of years. Um, been, been a tennis agent about um, 15 years now. Um, and um, yeah, started start my own business 18 months ago. Um, clients are Naomi, Nick, um, and Oz. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think being more than tennis players is kind of what is the heart and soul of transacting high level business these days. I think it's not enough to be just a great player. You have to be a great player and also um, either have an edge or have a message or stand for something. I, I mean, in terms of empowerment, I think um, the way I've always approached it with my with my players is let them be authentic and they kind of empower themselves. and. Um, then I kind of react accordingly. It's rare that I'll say, hey, you should take a stance on this or that. Yeah. Much more often, um, especially in Naomi's case, you know, I'm, I'm as surprised as the rest of the world when things happen. And then, you know, I'm kind of my job, I see to react accordingly and to um, um, support the messages that she wants to share. But I think the, the key to um, the key to letting athletes be authentic is really to let them be themselves rather than try and manufacture something because then yeah. it, the audience can tell when that happens. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think like tennis players have such an incredible platform. Um, sport is so global. There's very few sports that, you know, have a fan base so far reaching across the world and, and very different demographics as well. Um, so I think you should, tennis players shouldn't underestimate how much impact they can have. And I think, um, you know, not, all, all of these three players are great examples in their own way. Um, I think, um, you know, the impact Naomi's had obviously on mental health and the impact she had, especially in North America on kind of race relations and yeah. the heat of the George Floyd um, summer, I think was incredible, you know, when she wore her masks and won the US Open. I think that was like, really opened her eyes to be like, wow, like, I think she thought, she, you know, she had no idea how much of an impact it would have, and like, had no expectations. And I think that became something much larger than tennis. Um, so I think the platform allows you to, um, you know, really make a difference if you like to, it's not for everyone, like some players don't don't want to, you know, be in the spotlight in certain different um, forms. And that's totally fine as well. Like, there's no right or wrong. But I think Definitely, if, if you, tennis players are prepared to lean in, there's like a lot of scope for um, a big audience. Yeah, I mean, great question. I think she will answer it much better than I will. <laughs> but uh, look, I think she's just an incredible trailblazer um, for women in general, but especially Arab women and North African women. And I think to see someone like that, that they can look up to is incredibly powerful. And for her to take on this leadership position, I think just adds even more gravitas to that and shows how much she cares about the sport and making a difference. Um, and, um, you know, I think having had conversations with her, I think there's, you know, numerous issues that she's interested in, but one I know is at the forefront is gender equality. Um, I think that's extremely important to her um, and something I think she wants to dig into and lean into on the PTPA side. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, those two always like look to the NBA uh, okay. to kind of see what they're doing, like not just on the court, but also off the court. They always like get it right and they always seem yeah. one step ahead. And, um, you know, we've got close friends in the NBA who are tied up, obviously, with, with the, their player association. So we had conversations with them um, to learn more yeah. um, how we can bring that into tennis. And I think for like Naomi and Nick, um, the incentive is really like uh, to give back. Like, I don't think. Um, like, I think they want um, to make a difference for masses and for players further down the rankings that perhaps need support, you know, more than others. Yeah. Um, so I think they are very much, while tennis is an extremely individual, support, individual sport, I think they're also like very invested in the greater good, like for their, for their peers. I mean, even for the top names, like it's not as glamorous as it looks. You know, there's the hard work and the sweat and the tears that goes into everything and the travel. Um, 
I think obviously as you progress further, you travel in nicer seats and on better time zones and then you stay in nice hotels, but still very lonely and very isolating and like it's, it's a tough life, yeah. um, which is why I think we see so many people like taking breaks or um, trying to, um, you know, do things to help themselves. Um, but I think, you know, that's even at the top level. So, you know, further down, I think, um, you know, and I've been doing this 15 years, so I've worked with players at many different levels from juniors all the way up. And I think, you know, most players are, are, are struggling to break even um, and to have a career, you know, that shouldn't be the case. Like we, we need to really assess that. If you have a draw here, the tournament wants to put on a two week tournament because it wants to sell tickets for 14, 15 days here then you need 128 players on each side of the draw to have those matches. Um, so the importance of players at every different level of the ranking and their contribution to the system is what empowers the top players to do well. So I think it's just incredibly important that we um, take care of one another and support all levels of tennis. I mean, I think like, I, I, I really want like tennis to be self-sufficient um, so it's important to me that like I don't see a lot of things trickle down to the right places. So for example, I'm in the market every day talking to sponsors and companies and the economics of tennis and you know I'll, the, the revenue driven or the interest in, for example, Naomi, Emma, Coco is vastly superior than players on the male side of their age and ranking. Yet, you know, we're told consistently, well, the women aren't driving revenue at the um, combined event, so why should they be paid the same? And I think there's a disconnect somewhere because I know that the superstars are of more interest to the commercial world than their male counterparts in many ways. Um, and I think there needs to be some more equ equilibrium there so that, um, you know, we can really empower the female athletes to be these like great champions that they are. I think it's, um, you know, uh, it, it's in the name. I mean, I think the players need their own um, voice and they need their own institution. And I think the structure of, you know, the way the ATP board works, where there's a tournament council and a player council, obviously, um, obviously they're not going to be always aligned. Um, so I think the players need some independence um, in order to forward their own agendas. And I think in addition to that, there just needs to be a greater level of support um, that is autonomous and that is player focused. You take, I would say Halep's a great example right now where, you know, I don't know the details of her case, but I know for sure that they, there should be a hearing quicker than eight months, which I believe is taken already. You know, who, who, who at the tour is stepping up to help her? I don't think they're, they can because I think they're too tied up with the ITF and the um, um, WADA, etc. So I think in her case, she needs a, um, I mean, I'm sure she has her own people and her own team and her own lawyers who are doing great, but I think if she had a player union behind her, you know, that would add more gravitas and help push that issue forward. And there needs to be a resolution either way, um, but to not have a hearing um, is extraordinary. You don't get that time back in your career. Uh, it's, you know, it, it's, it, and, and if the outcome is favorable to her, you know, she's lost so much time, which is just so, so hard to take and unfair, I imagine, for her. So th yeah, there's an yeah. example. I mean, I think there's many different ways, but that's probably, the, for me, the most topical right now that comes to mind. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's, uh, I think that's the importance of working together. I think, um, you know, I, I, I don't know, I don't work for a big agency anymore, but, yeah. um, you know, I think, I hope that they get on board as well because they're often in the ears of the players right. and giving advice and opinions. And um, I don't think there's any agenda that is separate to, you know, you guys are just adding your additive to the process of what they do. There's no, um, there's no downside to being involved and to unifying and to have, um, you know, more support and more power. Um, so I don't see any downside whatsoever. I only see upside and um, yeah, that's, kind of how I see it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <Big one. laughs> I mean, that's what I spend 24 hours a day doing myself. But I think, um, yeah, I mean, to we say it doesn't drive the same level of revenue. I think, um, 
you know, from, from the side of the business that I'm on, yeah. I, I think it does. Like if, if I look at, um, obviously Naomi, who I work with, but Roger, Rafa over the years, Serena, Maria, they've always been up there endorsement wise, earning as much, if not more as LeBron, as Tiger, um, as, you know, maybe not Messi, Ronaldo, but you know, they're, they're always, they're always up there. Um, they, that's where they compete and or and certainly in the women's side, women's tennis always eclipses every other yeah. sport in endorsements. Um, on the court, on the field is where they, they lack. So often you'll see in, in tennis, at the top level, it tends to be when you look at a graph, um, income earned on the court is here and income earned off the court is here. And I think in other sports at the top level, if you looked at LeBron or if you looked at Messi, like there's they're maybe still ahead, but there's certainly much more um, um, parallels there. So I think there's a lot of catching up to be done, which is where I think the PTPA can um, come in. And I think, you know, the revenue that the tournaments drive like needs um, a much greater and firmer assessment of where that revenue goes. And we need to see more money filtering to the players. Yeah, I, I, I really see it as complementary and additive. Like, I don't think it's, it's and very candidly from like, from my players, I don't think that's something they're expecting to get rich on. I think it's more for them like a contribution to the greater good and to those players further down the ladder. Um, but I think it's certainly not impacting us in a negative way where we feel like we won't be able to do other stuff because we're constricted by the group licensing, like not at all, which I think worries probably other agents I think get stuck on that and concerned and for me that's not a concern at all I mean there's such different um, price points number one but also um, products and um, yeah I, I don't see uh, I, I again to I, I don't see any downside I just see it as additive to what I'm already doing <laughs> um, no I would look I think um, I'll, t I'll give you one example that I can think of is, is uh, um, the Netflix documentaries that came out, golf and tennis. Um, I think golf did a much better job of promoting their show. You know, I saw Super Bowl ads um, as it came out. I know like they partnered with Michelob and did a ton of activation and um, that show had a lot more press and buzz than the tennis one did. Absolutely no reason that tennis shouldn't have had the same. Um, and I don't know if that's the responsibility of the tours or if it's the responsibility of um, it's definitely not the responsibilities of the producers because I know them very well and they produced both the golf and the tennis and I think they're also you know wondering why is tennis not doing more to help itself and to promote itself um, so there's there's an example where I think we were kind of eclipsed by golf for no reason yeah. whatsoever um, I definitely hope that uh, the the women of you know, come much closer to parity. I mean, in a in hundred years, I hope that we're not even talking about it, to be honest. I hope there's no, I hope people in a hundred years don't even remember that it was a thing and they kind of look at the historical tech book, textbooks and they're like, what the hell? <laughs> um, so I think that's, you know, something that needs to, that needs to progress. Um, and then um, I think increased revenue going to players. Um, and I say that more for like, not the top tier players, as I think we already spoke about, like they get very well compensated off the court. But I think on the court, you know, not answering the question exactly as you asked, but um, all, all the sports are the same. If you go to basketball, um, it's LeBron, it's Steph, it's KD. Then there's a big drop off, even like superstars like Jason Tatum. They're not on the level of those guys in terms of marketability and revenue. Um, and tennis is the same. It's very top heavy. So those making like great, great life changing money is a very short list. Um, so it's the other players where I think I want to see like increased revenue and prize money that helps them yeah. continue and stay motivated and be able to improve and improve their conditions and um, really lift up the game as, the, as a whole. I mean, in some respect, I agree. I have to be honest, like I, I get so frustrated with tennis. Um, I'm trying to bring in, you know, you try and bring a brand in that's never worked in tennis. Um, we worked with uh, Sweet Green a couple years ago. Yeah, yeah who are a great brand, um, uh, progressive brand, young brand, um, great guys like our, our friends. Um, but we try and introduce them to tennis. And it, okay, we're inviting them to the US Open. Month in advance, when does Naomi play? <laughs> yeah. 
um, I'll, I'll tell you on the Saturday before. They're like, well, why do we book flights? Like, I'm like, it just, it is what it is. And then, then they're like, okay, so she'll play Monday or Tuesday. I say, yeah. And then they say, you know, Monday or Tuesday comes around, what time? Right. Like, well, um, she can play fourth match after 11. They're like, what does that mean? What does that mean? What are the matches before? And then, then they're just like, forget it. <laughs> like, I, uh, this, this is too much. And that's a brand that's invested in tennis. You take a, a kid or a new fan, like it's way too complicated to watch your superstar players and to plan for that. Um, I think tennis is extremely archaic in that. Um, I'm not sure five sets is the right format for me personally. Um, I think it needs to be quicker. It needs to be much better scheduling. Um, and until we do that, I don't know how you're going to have, you know, uh, how you're going to attract fans from age new fans from age 10 to 25 who consume obviously all their content on their phone as most people do or if you're watching a game you know the phone is the priority and the game's in the background um, so I don't think that leans itself into playing five sets for five hours when every set is seven six.